Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. If you're mayor, uh, 10,000 people get you to be in maybe a medium-sized rural town. Uh, if you're a CEO, 10,000 people puts you roughly in the middle of the FTSE uh, 100. So you're a big company, right? But you're not huge. Um, with a group of 10,000 people, uh, some bad things are bound to happen. Uh, if they're typical employees of a large company, uh, here are the bad things that they would have seen last year. Right? 900 incidents of harassment, 230 health and safety infractions, uh, 100 accounting irregularities, 80 instances of uh, bribery and corruption. Now let me point out that 80 is 8 tenths of a percent of 10,000. So if 99.2% of your 10,000 people saw nothing last year, right, in terms of corruption, you have 80 instances of corruption. This is a problem with large organizations and large numbers. Of the employees who believed that they saw a violation, about half reported it to someone in the company, and then the other half chose to say nothing, but some people are much more likely to have seen a violation of law than others, right? So if you were the mayor, you might say that some neighborhoods are safer than others, and it's true in companies too. Uh, it turns out that people are really afraid to ask these kinds of questions. Um, interestingly though, people aren't uh, afraid to answer these questions once you ask them, if you let them answer them anonymously. Um, and that's a good thing, because here's the big question we were looking to answer. Uh, what are the factors that make people more likely to commit fraud or misconduct? And our first step was actually to ask a couple thousand people two questions, just two questions. First, have you seen, have you seen a violation of law or policy at your company in the last year? And then second, if you did, did you report it to anyone in the company? So, two questions. Then, we asked them 200 more questions, right? <laughs> um, <coughs> What kind of policies does your company have? What kind of training, procedures, controls? What do you think of your colleagues? What do you think of your immediate manager? What do you think of the senior executive team? What protocols govern this or that situation? 200 questions. We asked these questions so we could figure out what are the factors that lead to misconduct. Uh, it turns out there actually is an answer, right? Um, we found seven things, seven things that reliably predict misconduct, and here they are. Comfort speaking up. So are you comfortable speaking up when you see something that concerns you? Uh, trust in your colleagues. Do you trust your colleagues? Are they honest? Does your manager respect and deal honestly with his or her employees? What's the tone at the top of the company? Does the company set clear ethical expectations? That's number five. Is there an environment of open communication? And then finally, organizational justice. Does the company take action when something bad happens? I think the most interesting thing about this list is what's not there. Rules, policies, technology training courses, newsletters, procedures, hotlines. We asked about those things, but they don't reduce misconduct, right? So they aren't on the list. Now, each of those things may be helpful in building some of the behaviors on this list, but it's the behaviors that matter, right? Not the policies, not the controls, not the training. You can outsource your IT. You can offshore customer call centers. You can hire someone else to drop your strategy and clean up your public relations messes and mow your lawn. Right? But you can't buy integrity. Uh, near as we can tell, corporate misconduct is 100% a function of management and employee behavior. And at the end of the day, you really can't outsource that. At this point, we've surveyed over half a million employees, 35 languages, well over 100 countries. Uh, and we've learned a few other things. We've repeatedly shown that there's a direct, straight line relationship between culture and misconduct. When culture, as we define it, is weak, misconduct rises and employees are less likely to report it always. Uh, further to that point, we know that people only report the misconduct that they see about half the time, but some employees are much less likely than others to report misconduct. Now, tragically, we know that this is how humans are, right? And so the question is, why? Why do we not talk about the things that we see that worry us? Uh, well, we ask people this, right? Here's the answer. Fear of retaliation. Um, people are afraid of how it's going to impact them if they speak up. So fear leads to silence. Silence, interestingly, signals to everyone else that misconduct might just be tolerated. 
So if you're looking for the root cause of everything, if you want to oversimplify a little bit, um, it's about a culture of fear and silence. That's the answer to our big question. If it turns out that uh, fear and silence are the root causes of misconduct, then it's equally true uh, that ethical corporate cultures are characterized by an environment of open communication. And we see that very clearly in the research. Um, the essence of a strong cor corporate culture, you could say, right, is transparency if you want a word. Companies with stronger cultures have higher shareholder returns and better total financial strength than those with weaker integrity cultures as we define it over the long run, right? And the longer the time horizon you look at, the stronger the relationship becomes. So higher integrity companies are a better investment. Why is this so? We don't know. That will not stop me from speculating. Um, uh, companies, with, <laughs> companies with higher integrity as we define it, right, are always more open, right? As we define it, they're better communication, more comfort speaking up, more information flow. Uh, we suspect that more transparent companies are better at lots of things, not just avoiding fraud and misconduct, right? So they're, they're better at picking good strategies and avoiding bad ones. They're better at communicating negative customer feedback and then doing something about it. They're better at resolving employee conflicts, rooting out bad managers. Uh, we suspect probably a host of other things. That, we believe, is why they make more money. Um, so why does this profitability point matter, right? If doing the right thing on its own just as an end in itself, isn't reason enough for your executive team to focus on building an ethical culture, well, um, then you are probably in very deep trouble, actually. <laughs> um, but if it's not, right, uh, then perhaps the lure of long-term profitability will do it. A few years ago, when the Radio 4 Today program did a poll on the most and least respected professions, it took many people, not least me, who'd recently become the editor of Management Today by surprise, because company director came 84th out of a total of 92 professions. So what, what is it, what is this central problem that people appear to have? And I'm really not sure what the answer is to this. These individuals are the people who take risks, they create wealth, they employ people, they provide goods and services that we can buy and use if we wish to make our lives easier and more fun. Um, is it because they're regarded as non-transparent or kind of overtly dishonest? I'm not sure. Um, and it was disappointing in a way because I think the atmosphere over the last decade in this country has changed towards business. I think what I discovered soon after taking out the editorship of the magazine that the whole world of business ethics and behavior was by no means straightforward and black and white. Japan had always been, I'd always thought, you know, had, had, fairly, had good standards of, uh, of, of corporate behavior. But then last week one heard of a Japanese executive in another huge firm there where he'd managed to blow tens of millions of pounds of his company's money in a casino. So I think there is an awful lot of alarm out there at the moment that the wider public hold. And we can't think that we're kind of um, pure here. I mean, my own branch of business has been under the spotlight in the last year because of what's happened at, at, at Wapping at, on, at the news of the world. And we're, we're regarding Leveson now, day in, day out, with absolute horror. And I would make, this, this will sound to you like special pleading, but don't tar the, the entire British media with, with that brush. There are, we are, I still genuinely believe, and I would say this even if I wasn't a journalist, that we are fortunate to have a, um, a broad, respectable, honest, and decent media in, in this country. And I think the, the, the potential damage that is going to be done to it by this um, could be critical. Whatever you say about Rupert Murdoch, and you know, um, many people have many things to say about him, he is still willing to loot to spend a million pounds a week supporting the Times, for example, which loses him a total of 50 million pounds a year. And if, if he gets rushed out of town, who is something, who, in whose hands is something like the Times going to end up, another Russian oligarch or what have you? So, I mean, in, in conclusion, I think it's easy for us in the UK and the US and the EU to condescend to those in the developing world. And we, we, we've still got our own yard to clear, but perhaps the anti-corruption drive that is going on at the moment will, will over a new generation to business. Um, companies aren't going to rid the, the, the world of corruption and efficiencies, but it's, it's from within business, from within companies, as the process of globalization continues, 
that a pretty good start can be made, I think. There are three areas I'd like to touch on, the communication challenges, um, dealing with our third parties and contractors to the front page of the FT, our third parties and contractors will look like Shell, um, and the international challenges. We're a large multinational company. We have about 100,000 staff. We have about 200,000 contractors at any one time. We sign about 10,000 new contracts with suppliers every year. So you can see there's a, there's a big challenge out there. Most employees are out there to earn a salary to look after, you know, to look after their family. Um, and they're busy doing their jobs with all good intent. Many companies make this world of ethics and compliance terribly complicated. So you have to make it simple. What are the things that you want staff to remember? You need to communicate, tone from the top, and, and you, know, you can get your chief executive and your executive directors to help create that culture. We've got our helplines. Uh, we make sure that people don't feel that there's any chance of retaliation if they've got a cause for concern. You tell them where they go for help if they've got questions. You provide training, so you, you, know, you, you let them know what the risks are so they don't stumble and make mistakes. Um, and it is a challenge because people are busy. We all get hundreds of emails. It's very easy to ignore things. So occasionally, somebody will trip over the line. And then communications comes back because consequence management is absolutely critical. Uh, with all due respect for privacy, we do actually communicate in a, an anonymous fashion about these events. So staff do understand that you know, they're trying their best and when people do go over the line, there are consequences for them. And actually staff like to hear that. They like to know that you know, we're keeping the house in order and that they're working for a reputable company. So I think many companies are putting a lot of effort into communications, but it is difficult. You really do have to avoid the communications overload. I think um, if we look at suppliers and contractors, they are seen as an extension of our company. So when you engage a contractor, I mean, it's a bit like you know, extending your own family. You have to make sure that your values are understood by them. So you have a duty to communicate to your third parties about what you expect. But you also must do your own due diligence. I mean, there's no excuse if you engage with a contractor and you haven't done the basic investigations to make sure that they're operating to the standards you'd expect. Um, and so we do do an extensive amount of due diligence on contractors and suppliers and third parties. There is a, a, a misconception that um, the West has got all of the laws and developing countries haven't. I think if you go around the world, you'll find that most countries do have anti-corruption laws in place. They've got emerging privacy laws. They've got emerging laws in all directions, and indeed our own Bribery Act is fairly recent here. So I think it's wrong to feel that we've got everything sorted here in, in the West. Um, the challenge for a global company is how on earth do you get staff to understand what law and regulation they have to abide in each country? Now, the way you address that is to take the poor staff member away from all the legal requirements and you translate them. And it is possible to decide what the what the rules are for your company. Um, and you, you might pick the three most stringent jurisdictions and actually put your program together to tell the staff these are the four things that we do here. You know, if, if, you, if you work with the assumption that your recruitment has done its due diligence, that you've espoused the values to staff, that you have communicated, that the guys at the top are communicating, the guys at the middle <coughs> have understood the simple things that they have to do, because they are squeezed in the middle trying to do their jobs, and that there are consequences for those that fall outside the boundaries and make mistakes, then the organization becomes more robust. It becomes very trusting, and people will pick up the helpline, which is a global helpline that any member of staff, any contractor or supplier, any member of the public can phone if they've got a concern, and it's mediated by a third party. And we've put, I think, over the last seven years in Shell, like many companies, a phenomenal amount of effort in moving from our country-based programs, because we've been around for over 100 years, not me personally, of course, but you know, the global program has simplified a lot. And it's also simplified our understanding that to do business in Kazakhstan or Britain or the US, the same standards are required. And our staff do understand that. Um, and we continue to put effort in. It is, you know, communication and keeping it simple is actually the essence of getting this stuff to work. I was promoted into my job to become the first head of ethics and compliance at Airbus four years ago. Prior to that, while we had disparate compliance efforts around the organization, we had no centralized organization. 
And one of the things I realized when I came into the role is I had to do a lot about studying people. And I learned rather early in my career that there's only one thing that adds value within an organization and only one thing that destroys value in an organization, and that's people. So if the people aren't with you, then you're going to have value being destroyed over time. Uh, we went through a very hard period, and this is nothing that is not in the public record, at Airbus approximately five years ago. We went through five CEOs in a matter of two years. You could look as you walked down the halls and people would just have their faces down. And it, it was just like walking through a morgue. It was a depressing place to be. But we got a change in management. We got really effective management at that time. And that management realized that we have to put the people first, and so they realized the value of the people. Being in the aircraft manufacturing industry, there is one paramount thing that we look for day to day in our jobs, and that is safety. If the aircraft is not safe, we will lose our brand, we will lose our reputation, we'll lose our customers. And we've always said that we have best in class product. And we have always stressed product integrity. But if we as an organization haven't stressed individual integrity, then the product integrity after a while will denigrate or deteriorate, we believe. And so we've been putting a lot in the last five years into employee development, employee engagement, employee management, and looking at integrity as being the foundation of everything we do. And one of the things we realized is in looking at ethics and compliance in the organization, we had to understand our own organization and then map the risks within the organization. Because you can't cookie cut out the program. If you look at Wendy's company, it's far different from us. And so in that organization, once you map the risk with the small resources that I can have, then I go to what Wendy does, and I put in the time in order to do the communications just in those targeted areas so that I can attack those risks. And one of the things that people like to see is where those risks are, not only in the supply chain, but if you have a global organization, you'll find that the risks are at the farthest reaches of the organization, tend to be higher than the closer they are to the center of power. Why? Because those people aren't visited that often. And I tell this to people, don't even go to your manager. Go to a friend, go to a colleague, and just ask them the question if something doesn't look right in order to get that second set of eyes on something. And about well, 10 years ago in my career, I worked for a different company. And in that company, I used to have to go up to the headquarters, which was in Minneapolis, Minnesota, on a regular basis. And I used to stay in St. Paul, Minnesota, which is right across the river, and got to know the bartender. After about four years of sitting across the bar from him, I was dating a young lady at the time. And I said, oh, I'm going to tell Al. Al's always given me good advice. So I sat there. I've got a big, big life-changing event here. So I sat down one night, and I got a hamburger and a beer. And I said, Al, I got some news for you. And Al said, what's that? And I said, Al, I think I'm going to ask my girlfriend to marry me. And he looked at me and he said, are you a complete idiot? <laughs> and just my look changed. I said, Al, what? I said, do you just have blinders on? I said, what are you talking about, Al? He said, for the last two years, you have done nothing but every month sit across that bar from me and complain about this young lady you're dating about, how unhappy you are in this relationship, how awful it is, and you're going to marry her. Well, guess what? Five years, you'll be divorced. If you have kids, you'll ruin their lives. Think about it, Donovan. And really, in talking to Al, it was the best <laughs> advice he could give me, because now I'm married with three lovely children, all of them who have been born in France, and uh, have a wonderful life, a wonderful wife, and a great job where I can sit and talk about these things and say, hey, if anything, if you just don't know, just talk to somebody. And that's the basis of building the relationship, transparency. It builds value within the organization. And at the end of the day, if people bring value, that's where your profitability comes from. Just for the benefit of those who may not know what Transparency International does, we are a global non-governmental movement dedicated to combating corruption. We define corruption as the abuse of entrusted power for private gain. So it's a non-legal definition that captures a lot of the mischief that you see in both the public and private sectors. Uh, we have done a lot of work over the years with the private sector. Uh, I do believe that the majority of UK businesses, and indeed businesses worldwide, uh, have a desire to conduct their business ethically, but do face challenges. And one of them is corruption. Now, I think it's a game changer for UK PLC, and indeed for foreign companies who have a business in the UK. Uh, because it creates a new corporate offense 
of failing to prevent bribery by any person associated with the companies. What it means is that if your agent in Kazakhstan, for instance, has paid a bribe on your behalf and you didn't know about it, you could still be held liable under the new law. You can't say that, well, I didn't know what the agent was doing. Uh, that's, you know, Kazakhstan's responsibility, our, our, our uh, company there. Uh, at the same time, the law gives you a defense against this liability if you can prove that otherwise you had robust anti-bribery systems in place. Now, I think this is very significant because I think it can actually drive positive changes in corporate culture because the message it sends to companies is, if you're honest, you don't pay bribes, uh, prosecutors don't, will not be looking at you. But if you are corrupt, uh, then it is absolutely essential that you get things right and have robust anti-bribery systems in place. Corporate values and attitudes are changing. Uh, I think, uh, leaving aside the moral issues, many companies do see ethical business as good business. It does translate into profitability. But questions are often asked about what do you do when you may be an honest company, but you're dealing in a very difficult environment where governance is weak and corruption levels are high. So do you make that so-called facilitation payment when you are asked to make those payments to get your goods through customs, for instance. You may have a consignment of perishable goods and you have to get them through. You may lose a contract, you may be a small company, and if you lose that contract, that's the end of your business. Our advice to companies in such situations facing such dilemmas is that you must continue to adhere to a policy of zero tolerance for bribery and corruption. And that should apply across the board. Uh, it's as important when you're dealing uh, in, in a developed country environment as you are in a developing country environment where corruption levels may be higher. And I think many companies have made this mistake. Uh, they don't pay bribes when they're operating in, 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 say, the US, but they lower the standards when they're operating, uh, say, in DRC. Uh, and in our view, that's absolutely wrong. If the tone from the top is sensible and is very clearly stressing the message zero tolerance, then it's very important that employees fully understand what it means. I think companies make the mistake sometimes of having a good anti-bribery system in place, uh, but then don't educate employees about what they need to do to actually put that into practice. And also there are conflicting messages which are sometimes sent. Uh, so on the one hand, staff are hearing the message that you, you can't pay bribes, you can't make facilitation payments. At the same time, the message from HQ is that you still got to get the contract. And so an employee then thinks, well, maybe just to get the deal, uh, I will have to make that payment, and I may get away with it. And that clearly is wrong. Even when you're operating in difficult environments, it is possible to implement a policy of zero tolerance. It doesn't mean that corruption will never happen. That's not what zero tolerance means. What it means is that you are doing your best to assess the corruption risks which affect your business, and you're putting in place robust policies and procedures explaining to your staff what they mean in practice, and you're giving them the support that they need uh, to put those policies into practice. People often refer to companies from uh, the so-called BRIC countries, uh, Russia, India, and China. Uh, we have found in our TI Bribe Payers Index that it is companies from these countries who have a high propensity to pay bribes when they're operating abroad. Now, the solution here is not to drop standards, because in our view, that will be a race to the bottom in which everybody will lose, but rather to maintain high standards, but to bring these other countries into the process. And th there are positive developments taking place. Russia has recently agreed to accede to the OECD Convention. Uh, India has ratified the UN Convention Against Corruption. So I, I think the glass is half full, and we just need to keep chipping away, uh, trying to create this more level playing field. But I get very worried when I hear people saying, that in these difficult economic times, uh, you know, maybe we should actually be relaxing these standards. I think that would be a disaster because the problem is that when you make these payments, you're actually increasing the cost of doing business abroad. On average, bribery increases the cost of doing business abroad by 10 to 20%. If everybody paid bribes, that cost would probably escalate by another 10%. So it, does, it hurts everybody in the longer term. How important is context? Uh, is it true that companies are more liable to uh, offend in a variety of ways than people within companies when they're in one of two states? Either they are, as it were, in a kind of upswing where they feel like they're invincible, we're talking here about banks and Enron, I guess, or when they're in the downswing, which is kind of you have to do anything you can to stay afloat, and so all is allowed. How important is context uh, 
in relation to to managing these issues. Well, and it's going to be really important over the next few years because it's clear that with the, the, the global economic situation as it is, the message from central office for these organisations is you, you've got to get that contract and for that people are going to become more, more desperate. So the temptation is inevitably um, going to be to, um, to you know, to pay the facilitation payments because what what you'll do is you'll get it in the neck back if you you know if you're if you're not there and it's going to be it is going to be fantastically difficult. So Dan, are there particular moments in the business cycle when when business leaders need to be particularly aware of the, of the of the temptations and dangers? We think cultures change very slowly and are hard to change. So my my reaction to the two sides of your question is on the way up, some of your companies that are skyrocketing are a function of a very charismatic, focused business culture that had some defects in it. And so it was always there, and the corruption may have always been going on. On the way down, I don't see that a company that was essentially in a, in a normal operating environment that was, nor that was typical, then you put all the employees under a lot of pressure, economic downturn, et cetera. Cultures just don't change that fast. We do see, I mean, we've tracked it. So we see the change when the economy is tough and when companies are under pressure, but we're not talking about a radical change from a company that has integrity to a company that doesn't all of a sudden. Even if the, even if the leadership wanted it to be that way, you can't change culture that fast. How dangerous is it, do you think, uh, the two of you, that you create a culture where there's an assumption that you can drive out the forms of extremely bad behavior and the danger is then that you become complacent. Uh, do you have to accept that whatever you do, there will always be m risks and there will always be bad people who do bad things? The world has risks. Uh, and it, it's really our job to mitigate risks. Um, our prisons are full of uh, you know, people who have got malevolent intent. You hope you don't recruit them, you, you do your due diligence. But if you do get a baguette, bad egg in an organization and they commit a crime, the best you can do is to have your, if you like, your infrastructure in place so that you can move them out and get rid of them. Consequence management is clear. I, I think for staff, um, if you've got some clear guidance in place, you are in a better situation to address any unpredictable event that, that happens. In a recession, people are under pressure. And I know from, uh, you know, Dan will tell you that, under, that there is a higher instance of fraud. So you make sure you're monitoring things. Um, and you're just a bit more on the ball. What is the balance, Patrick, between risk avoidance and risk mitigation? Uh, I, I think you ha have to balance both. You're always going to have bad apples. Very few times will you have bad barrels like Enron. And so it's looking forward, finding out what your risk picture is. And the most important thing, it goes to what, it, it, where mitigation is concerned goes to what Wendy said, it's organizational justice. If you have a bad apple, if you don't do something about it, and if you don't take care of it, then it starts the degradation of culture and people see that if he got away with it, I'll get away with it. What is the role here of people who have been uh, offered bribes, encouraged to do the wrong thing, in exposing uh, that? Is, is this kind of growing, particularly as a kind of internet phenomenon? So presumably, if someone is offered a bribe at a particular customs point, then everyone's being offered a bribe there. So if they go public and they say, I was offered a bribe, it kind of implies everybody else who's going through that route is probably taking the bribe. How important is that dynamic, do you think, to, to, to shifting values? It, it, it is important that the more people who protest about this, uh, the more likely we're going to see change happen. And is that happening now? Uh, it's happening, but I would like to see more of it. I'd like to see more companies acting collectively on the ground in difficult jurisdictions protesting when they are asked to make these payments. I'd also like to see uh, the governments of, uh, you know, where these companies are incorporated, their high commissions and embassies, backing them up, uh, you know, in terms of taking these issues up with government officials when this is happening. I don't think enough of that is being done. And also, um, uh, let's not forget that the, uh, you know, we often tend to think that it's only the foreign companies who are being hurt by bribery, but domestic corporates are also affected. And I don't see enough alliances being forged between foreign companies and domestic companies in places like India or, 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 or even, uh, you know, parts of the Middle East and, and Latin America. I think that we are also seeing the phenomenon of, of reporting of bribery uh, through the social media, uh, which I think is having an impact. It's increasing awareness that this is a problem and is encouraging people uh, to stand up and protest about it. And that means that over time policymakers have got to respond.